I've been working for the past five or six months on the fifth or sixth draft of my memoir, The Accidental Terrorist, which tells the story of six months of my life when I was a Mormon missionary in Canada. Elder Shun. Yes, that, that's what I was called back then. I finished my re revisions. I actually finished them this afternoon. So, <laughs> so, so now I can turn the book into my agent when, uh, when we're in New York this weekend going to see the Book of Mormon musical. <laughs> anyway, this is the story of how I went to jail and got kicked out of Canada forever. We're not going get to get to that part tonight, but back before I became one of the hosts, I'd read three times for Tuesday Funk from this book, um, three different sort of sequential chapters, and it's been a while, but I wanted to pick the story up again tonight. So, for a quick recap, it's 1986, and I'm 19 years old. I've been assigned with my senior companion, Elder Deadman, to this little oil town on the Alberta prairie called Brooks. I never really wanted to be a missionary, but there I was anyway because my dad had been a missionary, and that's just what you do. But my companion there in Brooks didn't want to do any missionary work, and I was depressed and really homesick, and I missed my fiance back home in Utah. I was 19, yes. And so I hopped on a bus late one night, a few days after Christmas, and headed south. Uh, but as you might have heard in the last installment, if you are a real diehard Tuesday funk, band, a local church leader in Great Falls, Montana, intercepted me in a bus station men's room and convinced me, if I really did want to go home, to go back to our mission headquarters in Calgary and get a proper official discharge. I think that maneuver is called the psych. So I head north again, and that's where we pick up the story in Calgary on December 31st, 1986. I followed Elder Fearing and Elder Hardy into the mission office. President Tuttle was waiting in the entry hall and greeted me with a firm hand handshake. Good morning, Elder Shun. Beautiful day, isn't it? Scowling, I mumbled something. It had been a long 36 hours and my mood was foul. I was at the end of my patience. We could have done this the previous evening when I'd arrived back in Calgary and I just wanted it over. Even as President Tuttle escorted me past the bullpen where the office staff worked, I was on my guard. I was ready for the assault on myself to begin at any moment. He waited, however, until the door to his office had closed behind us and he had settled himself behind his desk. Shall we pray, Elder? He asked, eyes somber but, but hopeful. I shrugged. Sure. We pushed back our chairs and knelt to one side of his desk. Elder Shun, would you? Asked the President, arms folded in reverence. Sure. I bowed my head and closed my eyes. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for all the many blessings thou hast given us. We pray to thee this morning that thou wilt send thy spirit to be with us, that we might conduct our business swiftly and decisively, and with thy blessing upon us, and we do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, said President Tuttle. If he had hoped to awaken in me a sense of duty and penitence, it hadn't worked. Have you spent time in personal prayer this past night, like I suggested? He asked when we were both seated again. Yes, I said. I tried to control my breathing because I was feeling a little dizzy. Tuttle leaned forward, his jowls stretching. And did you get any answer? I did. The spirit told me I'm right to go home. <laughs> Elder Shun, he said, spreading his hands and cocking his head. The spirit does not work that way. <laughs> I know what I felt, I said, a thrill of horror running through me. One does not contradict the word of one's leaders. President Tuttle's eyebrows drew together. You know, Elder, sometimes if we're not praying sincerely, or if we're not listening closely enough, we hear only what we want to hear. How are we supposed to know the difference? He sighed. We have to ask ourselves whether or not what we're feeling is in harmony with the commandments, with the words of our living prophet. Well, that gives us the answer before we even pray then, doesn't it? He nodded. Often it does. Often we know the right answer from the start then why bother to pray at all? So that we can gain our own testimony of those principles and commandments. But what if the answer we get doesn't match the one we've been taught? Then you keep praying until it does. <laughs> I licked my lips. I know what I felt, I said, though the words left me breathless. I'd never been this honest with a leader before, or this combative. I'm going home, President. Tuttle clasped his hands on the desktop, exhaling heavily. Elder Shun, he said, 
you're a brilliant young man, but that can work against you as much as it can for you. Satan loves to play to the vanity of the intellect. He can use it to convince you to listen to your head over your heart and your mind over your spirit. He shook his head. Don't let him do it. Don't let him win here. Don't make the biggest mistake of your life. I could barely get enough air to speak. My mouth was so dry it crackled. My mind's made up, I told him, though everything I'd ever been taught told me to capitulate. There's nothing you can say that will keep me here. After that, it got ugly. <laughs> though neither of us raised his voice. President Tuttle tried bribery. He'd heard reports from Brooks, he said, about questionable behavior on the part of the missionaries. If I'd stay, he promised to set me up in a new city with one of his best, most responsible elders as a companion. I turned him down. He tried scare tactics. He cited not just the commitment I'd made to God by accepting a mission call, but also the law of obedience I'd sworn in the temple. He observed that any woman who would have me after I'd abandoned a mission was not the sort of woman who would inspire me to the great achievements of which I was capable. He predicted that this dereliction of duty would cast a shadow as long as my life, impairing my ability to finish what I started, crippling my sense of self-worth, and setting a precedent for failure over which I would never triumph. No worldly success, he said, could ever compensate for this one preeminent defeat. He tried appealing to my senses of ambition and vanity by pointing out how difficult advancement in the church would be without a completed mission under my belt. I'm not saying that you couldn't ever become a bishop or a stake president, he told me. I'm just saying it'll be a whole lot harder and a lot more unlikely. I don't want to be a bishop or a stake president, I said. No one ever does, or if they do, they shouldn't get the calling. The conversation was plunging down the rabbit hole, and I wanted it to stop. I was tired, tired of fighting, tired of non sequiturs, tired of jumping through hoops at the behest of people who only thought they knew me. Did this Jay Matheson Tuttle character, this fat, smug man who in real life sold insurance, actually believe, as we taught our investigators in the second discussion, that the free agency of mankind, the right to make one's own decisions without compulsion, was one of the basic principles of the universe? I had come here in good faith. I'd been fighting for my right to choose for nearly an hour if not for days already. I was tired of it all, and I wanted it to be over. President, I said, this is pointless. How long do we have to do this? He froze, mouth open, hands raised, then slowly let his palms sink to the desktop. He looked me straight in the eyes. Elder Shun, Bill, listen to me. This mission is where your Father in Heaven wants you, where he needs you. It's where he commands you to be. Please, stay. No, I said. He let out a long, defeated sigh. Well, he said, looking not at me, but down into the side. Obviously, my breath is wasted here. If you want to leave, then by all means leave. I've got the paperwork next door. Let me just go get it. He shambled past me out the door, face falling, shoulders not quite square, and stirred up more guilt than I'd felt all morning. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. While I'm waiting for Tuttle to drop my paperwork, he tells me I have a phone call. It's from one of my friends from back in the Mission Training Center. And uh, he tries to talk me into staying, which doesn't work. Then I get another call. It's from one of my local church leaders back home in Kaysville, Utah. He tries the same thing. Doesn't work for him either. That and a thousand so far. <laughs> In the building's front meeting room near a fieldstone fireplace sat a blonde, upright piano. While President Tuttle prepared my discharge papers, a seemingly endless process, I ran through every mournful number in my repertoire. The phone, thankfully, had not rung again once I finished with President Clearmountain, but I could not stay cooped up in that little office. Elder Hardy wandered in after a while. Three months earlier, he and Elder Fearing, the assistants to the President, or APs, or apes as we called them, had stood at the front of this room lecturing to us greenies about mission procedures. The piano was placed so the sounding board faced into the room. He listened to me play for a minute or two before coming over, resting his elbows on top of the piano and looking down at me. He played beautifully, he said when I finished my number. With his hay-colored hair, freckles, and boyish grin, he looked like a marionette. What was that? Yeah, just this little thing I wrote, I said. You wrote that? I shrugged. 
yeah, I call it Stars in My Pocket Like Grains of Sand. Interesting title. I think it fits. I named it after a novel by Samuel R. Delaney. He nodded as if he'd heard of Delaney. I wish I could play. I took lessons when I was little, but I guess I didn't have the patience to stick with it. He gazed wistfully over my head. I sure regret it now. If I could play like you, boy. Did you take lessons? I laced my fingers together, cracked my knuckles. Yes. When did you start? I was nine, I said. How long did you keep it up? Seven years. I only stopped when my teacher couldn't teach me anything more. Gosh, that's a long time, said Hardy, nodding. It wasn't easy, was it? I bet it was hard to make you practice. At first, I said, but then I really fell in love with it. You couldn't get me to stop practicing. So it took you a while. Yeah. And it was worth going through that hard period where you didn't like to practice. <laughs> <laughs> I could be a little slow on the uptake. <laughs> but it hit me finally what we were really talking about. I sucked air through my teeth as my blood boiled. So, I said, folding my arms, were you up all night working that one out? Just, <laughs> just waiting for me to hit the piano so you could use it on me? My cold tone erased his smile. Elder Shun, he said earnestly, do you believe in the gospel? Do you have a testimony? Of course I do, I said, though I felt like a singer in a bad VH1 video where the lip syncing falls short of the emotion in the song. That's not the <laughs> issue. It is. It is not. Elder Shun, I'm just trying to point out to you that... Stop, I said, raising my palm. All I want to do is sit here and play. I don't want to hear your trite little object lesson. Well, that's too bad, said Elder Hardy, frowning. Maybe I read you wrong. Maybe Fearing and I should have handled you the way Mason and Sailor handled Runaway McKay. Did you ever hear about Runaway McKay? Yeah, I heard they called him a pussy. Hardy stroked his chin, looking at the ceiling. I'm not sure that's one of the names they called him, but they did call him names. No fancy tricks, they just badgered him until he gave in. Is that what I'm going to have to do to get you to stay? Call you names, Elder Shun? Sticks and stones, I said. You won't be around anyway when people start calling you runaway. That'll make it easier to take. He stared me down with that expression. So you have fun playing, Elder Shun. It's probably what you do best. He turned and left the room, but the piano had lost its charm for me. When President Tuttle summoned me back to his office, I thought it would finally be to fill out the discharge papers. Instead, he waved at the phone on his desk. Another call for you. <laughs> I rolled my eyes. Not interested in any more phone calls, President. I think you'd better take this one, he said. He left the room, pulling the door closed behind him. When I picked up the receiver, it was not without great apprehension. Hello? The voice that answered chilled me to the marrow. Son, hello. This is your father. I just about dropped the phone. Oh, fucking shit. <laughs> it was a grueling conversation. My father used every weapon in his arsenal. We'd been saving money for this mission all my life. I'd be setting a terrible example for my brothers and sisters. He and my mother hadn't raised me to be disobedient like this. Everyone I knew, right down to the mailman, would be crushed with disappointment. <laughs> Any marriage I entered into under circumstances like these would surely end in heartbreak and divorce, and I'd be killing any chance of converting my non-member cousins. We've been working on Linda and Devin for so long, and they're close, he told me. But if you leave, we'll never get them. Why should they change their lives for something you won't even change your life for? Rarely had I heard my father's voice so enervated, so swollen with emotion. It scared me. If only I'd had the guts to stand up to him before I ever sent in my papers, before I got in so deep. If only. But here I was, and no way was I giving up now. It's my choice, I said, with steel I never knew I possessed. I'm done with this. Son, my father pleaded in a strangled voice I barely recognized. I'm begging you, listen to me. I know exactly what you're going through. I barked a laugh. Yeah, right, sure you do. Just listen. He drew a shuddering breath. You know I went to Germany on my mission. I talk about it all the time. But the thing I never told you about was all the hypocrisy I saw. And I'm not talking about the German people. 
I'm talking about the missionaries. I had an image in my head of what a missionary was and how one ought to behave. What I saw there did not square with that. I saw elders not working. I saw elders at the beer halls. I saw elders on dates, not with random women either. I mean with girls from church. My stomach had clenched like a fist. I was appalled. I was sickened. My parents were dead, you know. And Bishop Klein wasn't sending his money to me so I could spend 30 months in Sodom and Gomorrah. I was older than the other elders. I had better things to do. I wasn't going to waste my time in a cesspool like that. I only finished six months of my mission. That was it. That was all I could stand. And you know, leaving seemed like a good idea at the time. The best idea. But it wasn't. Do you know why? Because I wasn't there for my own benefit. I was there for the Lord. And I let him down. And what have I felt since then? Nothing but pain and regret. Nothing I've done has ever worked out. Because I didn't stick things out in Munich, I've failed at everything. Not a day goes by that I don't wish, wish I could go back and change what I did. Son, that mistake has followed me through the rest of my life. Don't let the same thing happen to you. You're so much smarter than I was. Stay. Stay on your mission. Don't let your life go to pot like mine. I sat back, gasping. I couldn't believe my ears. But at the same time, the story made terrible sense. I wanted to weep for my father, for this wall he couldn't get past. But even more, I wanted to shake him, scream at him. All my life, he lied to me, lied about his mission, lied about his life. Here I was, the beloved firstborn son on the verge of repeating history, and I'd been lured to this pass under false pretenses. Son, said my father, are you there? I'm here, I said, the receiver clutched in a death grip. Thanks for filling me in. I'm glad you did, because now I won't make the same mistakes as you. I'm coming home, and I won't let it ruin the rest of my life. <laughs> the most disconcerting howl I had ever heard scoured my ear as my father broke down in sobs. The sound faded abruptly as my mother came on the line. Bill, what did you say to your father? She demanded. I thought I'd vanquished the mightiest champion President Tuttle could throw at me, but I hadn't reckoned on my mother. <laughs> she came from a line of pioneer stock stretching all the way back to the origins of the church. Through her, I was a direct descendant of Edward Partridge, the first Mormon bishop. Her father, Neil Partridge, was a stake patriarch, the man ordained and empowered to offer prophetic blessings to his fellow saints. I had never particularly regarded her as a spiritual powerhouse, and I knew she was perfectly capable of losing her temper with me. But nonetheless, for the next ten minutes, my mother drew on that heritage and proceeded to expound, calmly and convincingly, on all the positive aspects of mission service. At the end of it, I was dazed and battered. I could not have repeated a single word she said to me, nor could I have pinpointed the turning point in her argument. It simply <coughs> washed over me, leaving no impression on my memory as it erased my will and my resolve. I didn't know what had hit me. I burst into tears. Okay, Mom, I said through my sobs. Okay, I'll stay. It's the right thing to do, she reassured me. My father was back on the line with her, and his voice, his voice still in tatters. Obey your mission, President's son, he said, no longer combative. If you just obey, you'll be blessed. You'll be okay. Okay, I said, broken at last. Okay. Meekly, I crept into the bullpen to find President Tuttle. When he heard my news, he swept me into a joyful embrace, heedless of the office staff. Oh, this is such wonderful news, Elder Shun. I nodded dumbly, not sure what to say. You know, he went on as if unable to stop himself, if you were just some run-of-the-mill punk, I'd have given you a plane ticket yesterday. I'd have paid for it out of my own pocket. But you, I've known since we first met that you were one of the good ones, one of the great ones. You're going to be one of my leaders, Elder Shun. Mark my words. Well, I'm so pleased. Thank the Lord. This is a miracle. He left me standing there in the bullpen while he scurried off to round up the apes. My glance happened to fall on a sheet of notepaper lying on Elder Fearing's desk, a handwritten table of names. Idly, I rotated it with my fingertip. It listed the names and numbers of several of my friends, relatives, and church leaders. 
Each person I'd spoken with on the phone had a check mark next to his or her name. Thank you. <laughs>